So our warm up, the diagram includes a pair of congruent triangles. Use the congruent triangles to find the value of x in the diagram. So what's special about these is it already tells us that they're congruent. So we're just gonna find the corresponding part for x and then solve for it. So what should x be in the first one? Five. Five, very good. So for number one, you should have had x equals five. For number two, that x plus seven is gonna be equal to what? X plus seven equals? 15, so then x equals what? Good, you subtract seven from both sides, you get x equals eight, okay? And then in number three, what's the equation we should write? 2x plus 1 equals 5. five. We subtract 1 from both sides. We get 2x equals 4. Divide by 2. Divide by 2. We get x equals dos. Okay? So x equals 5. x equals 8. x equals 2. And our last one, same thing. You're going to set those both equal to each other. Okay? The reason we're doing that is because it already tells us that they're congruent triangles. Okay? It already tells us that they are congruent triangles. So we're just matching up the corresponding parts. So we got 3 minus 4x equals 2x plus 9. We can add 4x to both sides. We're going to get 3 equals 6x plus 9. And then we can subtract 9, subtract 9. Negative 6 equals 6x. Divide by 6, divide by 6, negative 1 equals x. The reason I picked this as a warm-up is what we're looking at right now is exactly what we're learning today. Okay, It's all about perpendicular bisectors and angle bisectors. Okay, So it's about lines that divide two parts of a triangle into two equal parts. It bisects the base and it's perpendicular to that base. And there's also ones where it bisects an angle, so it creates two equivalent angles from the one. Questions on the warm-up? Let's get started. Okay, so this is chapter six, section one, perpendicular and angle bisectors. Now, if you guys remember, a bisector means that it cuts a line segment in half, okay? What something must bisect, okay? It could be a segment, it could be a ray, it could be a line, it could be a plane, but it must bisect a segment, okay? What it bisects, must be a segment. And from this image, okay, we see that AB is bisected by CP. Why? Because AP is equal to PB, right? It splits it into two equal parts. So we know that it bisects it because it creates two equal parts, it crosses it at its midpoint. It's also the perpendicular bisector because it creates that 90 degree angle, which we see right here, okay? It's got that 90 degree mark. So what we can say is CP, the line, is the perpendicular bisector of the line segment AB. And just as a little refresher, equidistant means it's the same distance, okay? So A is equidistant. A and B are both equidistant from P. They're the same distance away from point P. That's what makes them congruent. Yep. Did you have a question, Marcos? Okay. All right. 
Does anyone need more time on this slide? Yeah. Do it. Perpendicular bisector theorem. So there's a theorem that comes from this. In a plane, if a point lies on the perpendicular bisector of a segment, then the point is equidistant from the endpoints of the segment. So CP is our perpendicular bisector of AB. How we know that is AB is cut in half by CP. Do you guys see that? Mm -hmm. It's congruent on both sides. The other thing is it creates a 90 degree angle, okay? So CP, when it, where it intersects AB, creates a 90 degree angle, so it's the perpendicular bisector. When you have that, okay, CP is the perpendicular bisector, this side, AC, is always going to be congruent to CB, okay? You automatically, automatically know that. You've basically created an isosceles triangle, okay? AC is always going to be congruent to CB. So just so we reinforce this, draw a point down below P, but still on CP, and label that point D. What two line segments using D must be congruent? DC. Say it again. DC. DC. What does DC need to be congruent to? No. CD, yeah, it needs to be congruent to itself. So it's not DC. Try a different one. It's not currently a line segment. So use a point that's not connected to anything. AD, good. Oops, that was bad. What does AD need to be congruent to? Good, BD. And the reason is, is because D lies on that perpendicular bisector. So any point on that perpendicular bisector, if you were to draw two line segments, two A and B, they would have to be congruent. Cool? So it kind of looks like a diamond right now, right? Just always think that if it's the perpendicular bisector, it has to lie along that. And that's what the perpendicular bisector theorem states. It's that if you can prove that CP is the perpendicular bisector of AB, then those any two sides from a point on that bisector must be congruent. All right, moving on. Yeah, that's fine. This one, Karen? Okay. Next, guys, the converse of the perpendicular bisector theorem. So we learned about the perpendicular bisector theorem. Now the converse says, okay, let's say AD and DB are the same length, okay? then CP must be the perpendicular bisector if D lies on CP, okay? If DA equals DB, then point D must lie on the perpendicular bisector of AB, okay? So the converse tells us that point D lies on the bisector, the perpendicular bisector of AB. So it's just using a reverse. So for the by, for the um, the converse, you're gonna see these two given, and you're gonna have to, and then from there you'll prove that it's the perpendicular bisector that CP is. Okay, and then lastly, we're going to see some examples of this stuff in action. Okay, so BD is the perpendicular bisector of AC. Find AD. If it tells you that something is the perpendicular bisector of something else, 
you're automatically going to use the regular perpendicular bisector theorem. So go ahead and write that down now that we're going to use. You guys can't see that, can you? What's a good color to use? Oh, there we go. Perpendicular bisector theorem. Would red be good? Nah. I feel like yellow is the best. By the perpendicular bisector theorem, what's true about DC? What does DC have to be equal to? DA. Good, DA. So what equation can we write? 3x plus 14 equals 5x. Good, 3x plus 14 equals 5x. And then we just solve this. So in order to solve this, we're just going to subtract 3x from both sides. We're going to get 14 equals 2x. Now we have to do what? Divide by 2. We're going to get 7 equals x. Beautiful. Is that our answer? No. What do we need to do with 7 equals x? Plug it in. Good. Plug it into AD. Okay. So we're going to take this 5x and we're going to plug in x equals 7. So it's going to be 5 times 7 equals 35, which is AD. And now we have our answer. Too many of us are still missing this on assessments. Okay. We're finding x and we're plugging it in. That was that multiple choice question on the quiz. Obviously, they're going to put what x is equal to on the multiple choice question. But it's up to you guys to plug it back in if it's asking to find AD. Now, if it was asking to find x, absolutely, x equals 7. But it wasn't asking that. Okay? Okay, let's do another example. Example 2. Okay, there's three parts to example 2. The, the most important one is number three, because that's where we're going to use the converse. But for the first one and two, it tells us that ZX is the perpendicular bisector of WY. So we already know we're going to use the perpendicular bisector theorem, the regular one. So just write that down. Perpendicular bisector theorem for number one, because it tells us that ZX is the perpendicular bisector of WY. Okay, knowing that, guys... What do we know about YZ and WZ? Good. YZ must be equal to WZ. So if we know that YZ is 13.75, what is WZ going to be? Good. 13.75. Easy enough, right? This side was 13.75, so then this other side must also be 13.75. Okay, number two, I'm going to switch up colors. I'm going to do it in red. I recommend you guys do the same. Number two, ZX is the perpendicular bisector of WY. Therefore, guys, we're using the perpendicular bisector theorem. WZ is 4n minus 13, and yz is n plus 17. Find yz. What do you guys think we need to do? Good, write an equation. What should our equation be? 4n minus 13 equals n plus 17. Good, 4n. I'm going to put number two down here. 4n minus 13 equals n plus 17. Because of the perpendicular bisector theorem, those two sides need to be congruent. So now we've got, we just add 13 to both sides, plus 13. 
we get 4n equals n plus 30 minus n minus n, 3n equals 30. We can divide both sides by 3, we get n equals 10. It's not our answer though. What's our answer? Yes, yz equals n plus 17. You plug that in there, you get yz equals 10 plus 17. 27. Okay, guys, number three. Why is number three a little bit different? Good. It's going to be the converse perpendicular bisector theorem. Converse perpendicular bisector theorem. The reason is because it tells us WZ is 20.5. And it tells us YZ is 20.5. But WY is equal to 14.8. So if WZ is congruent to ZY, we know that XZ or that z, it lies on the perpendicular bisector, right? So xz must be the perpendicular bisector by the converse perpendicular bisector theorem. So now we're given those two sides are equal, and now we can prove that that line up and down, zx, is the perpendicular bisector by the converse theorem, okay? So now what's true about wx and xy? What's true about Wx and Xy? Good. These two are congruent. So what does Wx have to be? We know that WY equals 14.8. Good, 7.4. So WX is going to be 14.8 divided by 2, which is just 7.4. Why do we divide by 2? Because it's split in half. Good, it's split in half. Okay, that's the definition of a bisector. Make sure, guys, when you're doing your homework, when you're doing these problems, you're putting the theorem that you're using. So when you're told it's the perpendicular bisector, that's just the regular perpendicular bisector theorem. When you're not told it's the perpendicular bisector and you're, that's what your conclusion is, that's where you're using the converse. Um, this class... 11, 10. And you get, ooh. Okay, guys, angle bisector theorem. So shifting gears a little bit. We're going to learn two more theorems. We're done, okay? Angle bisector theorem. If a point is on the bisector of an angle, then it is equidistant from the two sides of the angle. So, for example, we've got the angle BAC, right? It's cut in half by the, line, by the ray AD, okay? So AD bisects BAC. Therefore... BD and DC must be equal to each other, okay? The distance from D to both of those lines must be equal, okay? One thing that you have to note, make sure, make sure, make sure, this must be perpendicular. Look for right angles this and this if you don't have those right angle marks guys this doesn't work you need those right angle marks because remember that right angle mark means that you're taking the shortest distance from that line to point d if you don't have that you don't know if that's the shortest distance okay
Okay, and obviously, we're also going to learn about the converse to this theorem. The converse of the angle bisector theorem is if a point is on the interior of an angle and is equidistant from the sides of an angle, then it lies on the bisector of the angle. So for the converse, you're going to be given that BD is congruent to DC. And then you're going to be like, oh, then obviously those angles need to be the same as well. Okay. So AD cuts BAC in half. The ray AD cuts BAC in half. It's the bisector. Okay, questions on the converse. All right, let's do some examples. Example three. Okay, find the value of x. Well, first off, which theorem are we going to use? Are we going to use the regular angle bisector theorem or the converse? Regular. Regular, good. Why? Yes. It tells us that they're both 27, right? So we know it's an angle bisector. If we know it's an angle bisector, that's just the regular angle bisector theorem. Okay? So what's true about X? It's 15. Good. It has to be 15. These two line segments must be congruent. Wait, so how do you know the converse one? So the converse... Actually, just wait till for the next slide, okay? Next slide. What do you think we're using here? The converse. The converse. Why are we using the converse? Doesn't it, doesn't it cut like it doesn't give us the numbers? Good. It doesn't tell us the angle measures, right? It tells us that those two line segments are congruent, right? Oh, okay. So now we're using that to determine, okay, we know it's the converse. We can say that it is the angle bisector, okay? This is where we use the converse angle bisector theorem. Do you guys see that? When the angles aren't known to be congruent, then you're using the converse to tell you, okay, these angles must be congruent. What's my equation, guys? Mm-hmm. And we just solve this. You can add six to both sides. And then you can also subtract three X. And you're gonna get 11 equals X. Yep. Good, way to read the question again. Were you one of those quiz people? Uh, probably. <laughs> I released the answers to the quiz if you guys want to go back over them when you're done. Okay, two more examples, guys, and then we're done. Example five, find the value of x. This one's a little bit different. What are we using here, the regular theorem or the converse? The converse. converse. No, we're not using the converse. <laughs> You guys are so confident. Okay, why aren't we using the converse? Do we know that this is congruent to this? Or do we have that mark there? Yeah. No. no. Wait, which one? What we do know is that the angles are congruent, right? If the angles are congruent, what does that make this ray? The bisector. Good, it's the bisector. So we're going to use the regular angle bisector theorem. So this is the regular angle bisector theorem. So what must be true about these two sides? They're congruent. So we know that 5x must be equal to 6x minus 5. We can subtract 6x from both sides. We get negative x equals negative 5. x equals positive 5. Okay? So think about what it's telling you is congruent. We know that the two angles are congruent, right, for this one? So therefore, we're using the angle bisector theorem. If you're given that the two sides are congruent, converse angle bisector theorem.
Okay, guys. Example six. It's a little intimidating, guys, but I'm breaking it down into each individual step. The only way we get better at doing example six is by doing more of them, okay? Step number one for an example like example six, okay? We're going to write an equation of the perpendicular bisector of the segment with points P at negative 2, 3, and Q at 4, 1. Your first step, guys, is to graph PQ. And we already graphed it over here, okay? We put the points P and we put the points Q at their appropriate locations. We're good there. I'm going to show you why graphing it is so important. Number two, if, the, if we want to find the perpendicular bisector, let's dissect the word bisector. Where's the bisector going to be on PQ? And I don't want a coordinate. I just want a name. At the red line. Very good. What do we call that point? M, M for what? Midpoint. Midpoint. So step number two is going to be find the midpoint of PQ. Why do we want to find the midpoint? Good. We know where to put our line. And also, if it's a bisector... What's true about the midpoint? Good. The midpoint is the same as the bisection, okay? It's going to divide that line PQ into two equal parts, right? That's exactly what a bisector does as well. Okay, so remember our midpoint formula, M is going to be X1 plus Y, oh, sorry, X1 plus X2 over 2, comma, Y1 plus Y2 over 2. Let's make P our X1, Y1 and Q are X2, Y2, and plug them in. So M is going to be X1, which is negative 2, plus 4, over 2, Y1, which is 3, plus Y2, which is 1, over 2, and we get M is at 2 over 2, comma, 4 over 2, which is just M at 1, comma, 2. Okay, step number three. So we've got a point, but now we need to find the slope. So step number three is going to be find the slope of the perpendicular bisector. Oops. And before we do that, we have to find this slope of PQ. Remember, the slope of PQ is going to be y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Let's just plug those in. y2 is just 1. y1 is just 3 x2 is 4 minus negative 2. And then we're going to get negative 2 over positive 6, which is, what does that simplify to? Negative 1 over 3. Can Yeah, you could absolutely just count it on your graph. Okay, so you saw that the rise was what? Negative 2 down 2, and your run was 6 positive six, so you put negative two over positive six, you can absolutely do it that way. Okay, peeps, but that's the slope of PQ. How do we find the slope of something perpendicular to that? Opposite reciprocal. What's the opposite reciprocal of negative one third? Positive 3. 
So guys, step number four is we're finally gonna write that equation, okay? So step number four, write an equation. So it has m equals three, and it passes through the point one comma two, which is our midpoint, okay? So we're gonna use what we know, y equals mx plus b, y equals three x plus b. We're gonna now use this point, plug it in here, so we know x equals one, y equals two. That way we can solve for b. So we're gonna get two equals three times one plus b, two equals three plus b, subtract three from both sides. And we're going to get negative 1 equals b. What's my final equation? Nope. Oh, y equals 3. You could say plus negative 1 or just minus 1. Now, obviously, when you guys are doing this problem, okay, I want you to start by writing out the steps. One, two, three, four. You don't have to write, like, the actual step, like, find the midpoint, graph. But I do want you to, put like, number it. As you get better at these, you don't need to number. But when you first start, you need to number. So on your homework tonight, when you guys are doing these kinds of problems, I want you to number them. We have about eight minutes. I want you to turn these notes in. And let's get as much out of our gym kit as we can. Yeah, go ahead. Converse of the angle bisector theorem. Let me check. 